Hi, this is Rob Fitzgerald. Welcome to Lab Medicine uh, Quick Hits. We're going to be talking about reference ranges in the next 10 or so minutes. And uh, really what I want you to think about is a reference range is, many people call them normal ranges, and we really want to think about it as a reference range. You can be normal and be above, in, or lower than the reference range. And so um, we're going to talk about just briefly how do you determine reference ranges. Uh, it seems easy, but to determine a, a good reference range actually takes a lot of work. We're not going to get bogged down in the details, but it's important to understand the general concepts. We're also going to talk about sensitivity and specificity. And I want you to think about that as sensitivity and specificity being uh, characteristics of the laboratory test, whereas the predictive value, a really important point is, is that predictive values depend on the prevalence of the disease. And so we'll go through some examples and, and try to make sense out of that. Um, so reference ranges, uh, this is a Gaussian range, and in order to determine a Gaussian range, you need about 30 subjects. So you, you find 30 healthy subjects that are disease-free, you test them with a the laboratory test, you plot them as a histogram, and basically you take the mean plus or minus two standard deviations, plus or minus two standard deviations of a Gaussian distribution is the inner 95%. And so that works fine if it's Gaussian. If it's non-Gaussian, you need about 120 subjects. And you can see how that can become very complicated if you have reference ranges that are age-dependent or sex-dependent or both. And so, um, again, the, the concept of a reference range is important, and that's what we're going to stress today. A reference range is the inner 95 percent in the vast majority of cases. And what that means when you're thinking about ordering lab tests is that 5 percent of the time, on a healthy population, you're going to get an abnormal lab result. And so, obviously, if you order things that are not necessary, you're going to be obligated to follow them up. So our inner 95 percent is our reference range. At the uh, lower and upper ends, we have a, what we call false positives. They're going to be incorrectly classified because we're just talking about the inner 95 percent as, as a reference range. And that's fine, but really it's a little bit more complicated than that in that most uh, populations, you have a healthy population, you have a disease population, and they are somewhat separated by a lab test. And so how do we characterize them as being elevated or normal? We have to come up with some decision point. And how we determine that decision point depends really on what the test is being used for. And uh, for example, if you have a highly contagious disease, you want to be very sensitive and you want to pick up all of the disease state. And so you want to shift that decision point to the left so you pick up everyone that has disease. What that does is that's going to increase your false positive rate. And so in the cases where you need to be both sensitive and specific, oftentimes we will combine two different kinds of a test, a very sensitive screening test along with a very specific confirmatory test. We classify uh, the different parts of this uh, underneath these curves based on the decision point as true positives. That's the disease state, someone who is diseased and is correctly classified as being elevated. True negatives are healthy that are classified as being healthy. A false positive would be someone who is healthy but is classified by the test as, as being a positive result. We talk about sensitivity and specificity, and again, those are characteristics of the test, and they are independent of the prevalence of the disease. So a sensitive test is the ability to pick up true positives over all that should be positive. Specificity is true negatives over all that should be negative. Predictive values, again, depend on the, on the prevalence of the disease, and predictive values really is the percentage, a positive predictive value is the percentage of positive results that are correct. So that would be true positives over true positives plus false positives. Predictive values of a negative test, true negatives over true negatives plus false negatives. So the percent of negative tests that are correct. So let's look at a, a, an example. So we have two populations, a healthy population and a diseased population. There happens to be 100 people in each of these populations. And if we do our calculation for sensitivity, our true positives, 68 over 
um, all that should be positive, that would be the true positives plus the false negatives, we get 68%. Looking at the positive predictive value, that's the true positives over all the positive results, um, 68 over 68 plus 2, which is the two false positives, we have 97% positive predictive value. So what happens is it's unusual that we would have a, a, a healthy and a diseased population that are where the prevalence is 50%. So let's look at exact same tests. So the, the, we're using the same test that has the same sensitivity, the same specificity, but we've now changed the disease prevalence, so we, we've essentially multiplied the healthy population by a factor of 10. So our prevalence is now 9%. And if we look at our sensitivity, it hasn't changed. That's a characteristic of the test. But if we look at our positive predictive value, it's gone way down. So our positive predictive value is 68 over 68 plus 20, or 77%. So again, just as a quick summary, uh, the sensitivity of this test and the specificity of the test haven't changed. They're both sensitivity 68%, specificity 98%. And using that test, if we look at varying the prevalence of the disease, what happens to our predictive values? And so you can see in this chart, the prevalence starts out at 50% and it goes to 1%. And as the prevalence drops, the positive predictive value of that test drops. So we haven't changed the test at all. It's solely the population that we're testing. Um, and so the reverse is true. As the prevalence decreases, the negative predictive value goes up. It makes sense. If everyone's negative, it's easy to be right when you have a negative result. Um, and so where does this become important? It becomes important when you're screening people in a population that has a low prevalence. It's very hard to have a good screening test in a low prevalence. You can have lots of false positives. So take home message is that predictive values are, are dependent on the prevalence of the disease and when you're ordering lab tests you need to think about that. Thanks for your attention.